um, you know, regulations around dollar-based stable coins. Those stable coins, depending on who issues them, can be just as programmable and surveillable, if not more so than anything that the Fed could potentially put out. And it's important to keep in mind, too, that the Federal Reserve is essentially owned by the private commercial banks in the United States. So having the private commercial banks directly issue programmable, surveillable money to the American public is really fundamentally no different than, you know, the ability to control and, and, and surveil our money that, you know, there's, I think there's going to be a, a distinct effort to do that. So and one of the pillars of the economy to come doesn't just include CBDCs and their private sector equivalents. It also includes carbon markets. And that's why some of the key entities uh, that are being used to create and develop this system, like the World Bank, for example, that's why we've had Carney, uh, BlackRock's Larry Fink, for example, say the key to tackling climate change is... Welcome back to Crypto Insights. In this video, we will bring you the highlights from Win A Web's recent interview on Redacted. As always, time is money, so don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell to stay updated on the latest developments in the crypto space with these various uh, pillars of this new financial system, which again includes carbon markets, but also includes digital ID, ending online anonymity, uh, and, and digital uh, money that is both programmable and surveillable. And it's important to point out too that CBDCs are that, but there's also efforts to create private sector equivalents that are just as surveillable and programmable as CBDCs could be. It may not be the central bank programming them, and passing your data to the government. But um, JP Morgan doing that is really, you know, at a functional level as far as it affects human freedom and civil liberties, really no different. And there's efforts to foist that upon the American public as well. Um, the idea of, uh, you know, these stable coin, the stable coin bill, for example, that's come up um, in Congress and trying to create, um, you know, regulations around dollar based stable coins. Those stable coins, depending on who issues them, can be just as programmable and surveillable, if not more so than anything that the Fed could potentially put out. And it's important to keep in mind, too, that the Federal Reserve is essentially owned by the private commercial banks in the United States. So having the private commercial banks directly issue programmable, surveillable, money to the American public is really fundamentally no different than the Federal Reserve doing so since they're ultimately controlled by the same entity. I mean, the most right. powerful bank in the Federal Reserve system is the Federal Reserve Bank of New York and the biggest shareholders and controllers of that are JP Morgan and Citigroup as an example. So having JP Morgan and Citigroup give uh, issue stable coins that are programmable and surveillable and have that face the public. I mean, that's how you're getting the CBDC under a different name. Uh, but they're going to try and frame it as private sector innovation. And it's not a, you know, we're against CBDC, just like Ron DeSantis and Trump have publicly said, but are they against these program? Are they against programmable, surveillable money period? Are they against JP Morgan and Citigroup or BlackRock or whoever, any of these Wall Street in entities issuing these types of currencies to people and having them use it. I haven't heard anything in that regard. And JP Morgan, for example, uh, completely canceled the bank accounts of top executives at Dr. Mercola's company right. uh, without any explanation given. I mean, the private sector has done this. Um, and, and have done it without really any meaningful backlash or any meaningful consequences. So to give them, uh, you know, the ability to control and, and, and surveil our money that, you know, there's, I think there's going to be a, a distinct effort to do that. And um, it's interesting too, is that uh, when, uh, during the Trump administration, Jared Kushner was actually promoting the idea of creating a USD coin, a stable coin that functioned just like this, uh, talking to Steve Mnuchin, yeah, so the end goal of this is to have it integrated with all of these things. So one of the pillars of the economy to come doesn't just include CBDCs and their private sector equivalents, it also includes carbon markets. And one of the main architects of this coming system, people like Mark Carney, the UN uh, envoy for climate finance, who was previously head of the Central Bank of England and, and also Canada, has been one of the point men appointment for this. And there's a lot of different factors that are uh, going to feed into this new financial system. So you touched on a few like digital ID um, and also like the digital wallet and carbon markets are meant to be part of that. And that's why some of the key entities uh, that are being used to create and develop this system, like the World Bank, for example, that's why we've had Carney, uh, BlackRock's Larry Fink, for example, say the key to tackling climate change is reimagining the World Bank specifically. 
in other parts of the multilateral development banking system, they're working alongside groups like uh, Google's philanthropic arm, Google.org, on creating climate wallets, or, or rather requires things like the digital ID and all of these different things to function. And what's interesting about this Green Plus program uh, in particular is that they're trying to place this specifically on the Bitcoin blockchain through a sidechain protocol uh, that, that is, is linked to Bitcoin called Rootstock. Um, and so there's these efforts to have, um, you know, if people like Larry Fink have come out and said uh, everything is going to be on a universal ledger as he's talking about, you know, the launch of Bitcoin ETFs and the, all the tokenization of real world asset efforts. And this goes, you know, this is this is the digital ID agenda. It's essential to this new financial system they're trying to make. And carbon markets are a key part of it, but they've been routinely overlooked. Um, for, you know, even though it's framed as a, as a service to bank the unbanked, uh, recently uh, allowed the FBI, the Secret Service, and U.S. intelligence agencies access to its platform so it can blacklist anyone. And it's presumably a private sector you know, issued stable coin to a degree, um, but it's the biggest, also the biggest purchaser of U.S. Treasury bills or U.S. government debt. And there's a very, uh, you know, having people like Mnuchin, Cantor Fitzgerald tied up in this uh, particular, you know, carbon market surveillance paradigm uh, that's being, that's been imposed in Latin America through these like opaque contractual agreements at the municipal level throughout the continent. Very big things are happening here. And actually the head, the guy that runs Teller, a guy named Paolo Arduino, Another thing that I should mention in the context of carbon markets is that when you certify a carbon credit uh, based on a, you know, a forest somewhere, let's say a, a chunk of Colombian rainforest, uh, there becomes this issues of carbon rights. Who actually owns the rights to the carbon in the tree? The person that has bought the carbon credit, do they become the owners of the carbon represented uh, in this particular forest? And there's actually no existing legal framework to say that, you know, that's not the case. It definitely is being uh, posited by certain groups involved in this, that there is a, a way to obtain land by purchasing the carbon, carbon credits, hmm. or, or rather, if not directly obtaining the land, being able to exercise control over how that, that land is used and managed, or if it can even be exploited or things like this. Um, so there's a lot of interesting issues here uh, that are really troubling as it relates to Latin American, both financial sovereignty and environmental sovereignty, really. And also by creating these contractual agreements at the at the municipal level, you're uh, going around national governments and going straight to local governments, which at least in Latin America um, are quite easy to bribe. This can be, you know, not that national right. governments aren't susceptible to that, yeah. but at the municipal level, uh, th there's a lot more uh, entrenched corruption in that sense. It's a, it's a lot easier to influence them in that regard. And it doesn't get national media coverage because it's happening on the local level. And another thing I should point out, too, is that some of the actors here are career financial criminals. Um, for example, one of the main funders of the, one of the entities behind this, who's actually a big figure in UN-backed green finance initiatives, is a man named Craig Kogut, uh, who was directly and intimately involved in the junk bond scandal of Drexel Burnham Lambert in the 1980s. And oddly enough, the person who invented carbon credit trading was a senior vice president at Drexel Burnham Lambert when that same scandal was ongoing named Richard Sander, and he's also the father of derivatives and the creator of the collateral mortgage obligation, or CMOs, which is essentially what caused the 2008 financial crisis. 